go. Sorry about the technical difficulties. That's one of the problems with going live is you always got uh, something and sound issues are, are one of those things you you often have. So so we are we should be good to go. So today we're talking about manganese and water wells. Uh, this came up because I had a small system that got a hold of me. They have a manganese issue that they're having trouble wrapping their arms around and and we're going to help them but uh we decided that what we're going to do is this week we'll talk about manganese and water wells as part of groundwater talk live and and so uh we got some fun stuff coming up here and some stuff you may not know about manganese it's it's probably less understood than it's uh, a first cousin iron so uh iron and manganese tend to go together but but it's uh it's less understood there's some chemical differences but there's a lot of similarities too so so let's uh before we dive into that though let me give a shameless plug for some training we have coming up we're on december 21st we're gonna have we're gonna do a one-hour training event on the well health chalk process for uh, diagnosing well problems so so the manganese stuff would certainly fall under this area something we we'd look at as part of the well health check process we'll cover all that in, in that one hour training this is uh the the url to to register is there it's it's 49 dollars. it's a one hour training event there will be a certificate available uh, certainly for California folks, uh, for uh, for contact hours, and if you're in other jurisdictions, we will provide a certificate also, and and you can work that out. But uh, it should be interesting. When we do our trainings, we we pack a lot in there, so you'll get a full hour's worth. That that's for sure. And then uh, we're certainly available for any questions and stuff too. So that's going to be a live training, and and you will be. Um, certainly allowed to ask questions and and actually i encourage that because it makes it a little more interesting than just having me talk all the time so so there's the shameless plug for today let's let's move on to our topic for today and we're really going to be dealing with uh with manganese and this is where it falls on the periodic table of, of elements uh it's it's uh, element number 25 on there so you can see it's sandwiched between uh, chromium and and iron where it shares some some cotton because it's on the in the same part of, of the uh periodic table it's in a it's called the transitional metal is is really where where these fall on there and so they share ca uh, common chemical characteristics so so even though it has its own unique chemical characteristics it does share a lot of similarities especially with iron but also chromium so so iron and, and manganese tend to go together in a lot of cases we'll we'll be looking at that relationship as as we go along here and and some of the say things we say about manganese accumulation wells certainly will apply to iron a, as well but uh it's certainly uh something something to look at but but we will folk be focusing today pretty much on on manganese you can't help to talk about iron but, but our focus will be on on manganese so so manganese is is like i said it is uh, uh element number 25 on the periodic table it has an atomic weight of 54.938 uh, the symbol, of course, is MN, not Minnesota, manganese. And it has uh, valence states of plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, plus 7. Of those, plus 2 and plus 4 are really the most common that, that we see out there. And that will be important as, as we go along here. And valence states really indicate how many open slots the uh, the uh, a an atom of, of manganese has to accept electrons. So so if you have a plus two state, that means there's two more protons than there are electrons. So that that manganese atom can actually accept two more electrons. So from from an electron donor. So this becomes important when you're combining with other elements, and we will see how how that happens as as we go along here. So, and also before we uh, before we really dive in here, uh, please drop a comment in the chat if you're here. I know Steve's here. Um, 
And and so if you're here, tr just drop a comment in the chat so we know you're here and we can we can track you. And, and we do appreciate everybody that shows up here. If you're watching this on on replay, then then certainly comments are, are certainly welcome there as well. But but I just always like to, to see who's here and and get some some comments from from people in the chat. So so drop a comment in if it's just to say hi, we can go from there. All right, so a little background on, on manganese here. Um, manganese really is one of those things that's considered an essential nutrient for, for humans. So, so when, when you take your vitamins, you'll usually find some, some component of manganese. But, but with all things, you can have too much of a good thing. So, so we, can, we can actually have uh, uh, too much manganese. And so higher levels of manganese, especially in groundwater, certainly have impacts, uh, health risks. So, so the EPA has a secondary MCL or maximum contaminant level of 0 0.05 milligrams per liter. Now, the EPA does not enforce their secondary MCLs. So, so the, that is not enforceable on a national level. When you get out to California, they have a secondary MCL that's the same as the EPA's, but California enforces their secondary MCLs. They have secondary MCLs in California for both iron and manganese, and those are considered enforceable in California. So, so same, same uh, uh, level of 0 0.05 uh, milligrams per liter, but in California, it's enforceable. I don't know of any other states where they have their own secondary uh, enforceable MCL for, for manganese and iron, but, but uh, California certainly does. Uh, now, <clears throat> EPA is planning in their, uh, their uh, prospective contaminant list that they came out with a number of months ago. That's number five. They are planning to promote a primary MCL, which will then be, once that's approved, and that's probably going to take a few years to go to, through toxicology and, and, uh, and develop the levels that they're going to uh, propose for, for primary MCL. But at that point, once that is approved, that, that uh, MCL will be enforceable on a national level. So what California does... Uh, beyond that, whether they, my guess is they would probably follow suit and make it a, a secondary, call it a primary instead. But, but really, in California, there's no difference between secondary and primary MCLs because they're all enforceable. So, so there may be some slight distinction, but for people that are being regulated, no real difference between a secondary and a primary MCL in California. All right. As I mentioned, uh, valence states of, of plus two, plus three, plus four, plus seven for, for manganese. Uh, the most common we're going to see is plus two and then plus four. Uh, it, it oxidizes, not oxides, so that's, that's a typo there. Sorry about that. It oxidizes in water uh, from plus two to, to, to plus four. So, so soluble manganese is going to be manganese plus two, uh, a stable form of manganese that's going to form into stable compounds is going to be plus four. So, so the manganese um, nodules you see and accumulations you see on your well casing is generally going to be a manganese plus four that's going to be combined with some other things, form an oxide or an oxyhydroxide or a carbonate, and that's generally going to be a manganese plus four that's going to uh, um, that's going to accumulate on on your well. So, and as I said, uh, because it's right next to iron on the periodic table. It does mean they share similar chemical characteristics, and so that's that's the deal with manganese. Um, manganese typically tends to precipitate out of solution uh, in in groundwater when it reaches levels above 0.1 milligrams per liter. Now you contrast that with iron that starts to precipitate out when it gets to to one, so uh, one milligram per liter. Iron then takes a higher level to start precipitating out. Manganese precipitates out. It reaches saturation at, at a much lower level. So, so that's something we can monitor when we're looking at wells and, and, and part of the process we're, we're going to talk about later for monitoring uh, manganese. We can see it 
we want to monitor those levels. And when it starts getting to, to 0.1 milligrams per liter, up to 0.2 milligrams per liter, then you'll see it start to see significant precipitation or accumulations of, of manganese in your in your well. So and those are going to usually take the form of a black manganese oxide. Uh, that's going to be chemical formula MN304. And sorry, my, my software here does not do subscripts for uh, for the numbers, so it so it does look a little odd, but it's just kind of dealing with the technology, I guess. So manganese uh, accumulations can also show up as a dark brown to black manganese oxide, so that's MnO2. And so those are the two forms you're generally going to see uh, manganese in. Uh, that, that second one is a pyrolusite, is, is really the mineral name for that. And um, it's going to contrast with, if you're looking at a, at a well video, for instance, and you're looking at, at the accumulations of these little nodules that form in there, if it's black to, to dark brown, that's typically going to be manganese or have a manganese component to it. Uh, if it's orange, uh, orange to uh, to kind of a, a brownish color, that then is going to be iron. And, and generally, you can tell by looking at it whether it's manganese and, or, or iron. And and of course, a lot of times the the iron and the manganese will go together. So you'll see blotches of, of black and and the dark brown and blotches of the orange in in your well. So you're going to have both iron and manganese. They they tend to go together and accumulate together. So so you're going to see them together. So and also the presence of iron or manganese oxidizing bacteria can increase the potential for for manganese accumulation as well. We're going to spend a bit of time talking about the the bio uh, uh, the bioaccumulation of, of manganese because it does have a significant component. Evers are finding out on a lot of these things. Iron and manganese particularly have a biogenic component to them, the accumulation. So most uh, most manganese accumulations are going to be, uh, probably have a biogenic component to them. So the bacteria is going to be involved. So we'll talk about that a lot more as, as we get along here. So. Um, like I said, the presence of iron and manganese oxidizing bacteria can increase the potential for manganese accumulation. Aeration, so water coming in the well and, and um, coming in as turbulent flow and stuff can aerate the well. That can also change the pH and EH, and, and we'll look at that here in just a minute. And that can increase the potential for manganese precipitation as well. So, so these are some factors we look at for uh, do we have the potential for manganese accumulation in, in our wells. Manganese states, so we have our manganese uh, plus two is the soluble form of manganese. That's what you're going to find in solution in your well. So uh, we tend to speciate these things when we do our well health check. We'll talk about a little bit later and look at do we have manganese two versus manganese four. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's right. Steve points out biogenic means it's produced or brought about by living organisms. In this case, it's going to be a manganese oxidizing bacteria. So, so getting back to our, our, uh, what we're looking at here is, uh, manganese two is our soluble form of manganese. So that's, what's going to be in solution. As manganese precipitates and comes out of solution, it's going to oxidize. So, so we're going to uh, oxidation means you're removing electrons. So you're going to move to a manganese, generally a manganese plus four, and that's going to form uh, oxides, oxyhydroxides, and carbonates uh, in in your well. So it's going to precipitate out, and so those accumulations in your well are going to take those forms, and most of that is going to be done by by biogenic action. So there's there there can be some chemical component to that, and we'll look at that here. But but 
really a lot of it has to do with uh, manganese and iron oxidizing bacteria in, in your well. So as we're finding with a lot of the contaminants, even things like arsenic, when we get into wells, really have a biogenic component to them. So, so the biology and the microbiology in your well is really, really an important topic. And this is one of the things we address in the well health check process uh, that, that we'll talk about when we're looking at, at evaluating manganese in your well is that we, we tend to look at the, uh, the, the bacteria component of the well and, and what that bacteria really tells us about your, your ability to accumulate uh, manganese or, or any contaminants, really. All right, so this is a little complicated, a little chemistry here. This is a phase diagram. But what's important to note here is that uh, the EH on, on the left uh, axis is really the oxidation reduction potential. So the positive numbers are oxidizing environments, uh, generally tend to be more aerobic uh, or have oxygen in them. Uh, the negative tend to be uh, reducing environments uh, or anaerobic environments or, or non-oxygen. So, so that's what the EH is. It's, it's measured in volts. Um, the pH on the bottom scale, 7, of course, is neutral. Anything uh, below 7 is going to be acidic. Anything above 7 is going to be more alkaline. So we can see what happens is in a well, if you have relatively low pH or anything below, say, 6, and a positive oxidation reduction potential, then we're going to have free manganese in solution. So that manganese 2 is actually going to be in solution. Now, as the pH increases and or the, uh, the, uh, the ORP drops, the, the EH drops, now we see the manganese can, can then start to accumulate and precipitate out. So these are the chemical conditions that, that are going to uh, uh, allow manganese to precipitate out. And what form it takes really depends on, on the particular chemistry at that time. So you can see where uh, the, the higher pHs and you know, the, the uh, low to, to low positive to, to negative ORPs then are going to give you a manganese uh, uh, carbonate, which is going to be a rhodochrosite. Um, and then you know, high, real high pHs and, and the higher ORPs are going to give you some sort of manganese oxide, manganese dioxide, and uh, yeah, so yeah, Steve points out anaerobic environments like those at the bottom of the wells or without adequate flow are going to be low oxygen, they're going to be anaerobic, they're tend to be going to be tend to be more reducing environments. And so you're going to have a negative ORP and that's going to put you down at the lower end of the scale. So so this really this chart it, it looks a little complex, but it's really predictive in in what type of environment you are going to get uh, uh, certain types of uh, manganese uh, accumulations and the type of accumulation you have, whether it's an oxide, whether it's a carbonate, is really going to make a difference in how you're going to clean that out when it comes to well rehabilitation. So, so it is important to understand the chemistry of, of your well and what type of accumulates we're, we're getting in the well. And, and this little chart helps us to, uh, uh, to, to really look at that. All right. So when we get to uh, manganese stability again, this is this is kind of what we're looking at. Is probably your your two most common ones are, are going to be the manganese oxide uh, dioxide is is uh, pyrolusite, and that's a stable compound at a high redox or the high OR, ORP, um, <clears throat> regardless of, of the pH. So it's going to be it's going to have a if if you have a a high ORP or a high positive ORP, you're going to get pyrolusite accumulations forming regardless of of the pH across a wide range. Now the manganese carbonates, which is going to be you know, the mineral name is rhodochrosite, that's going to be stable across a wide redox range and pH range. If carbonate 
uh, levels are, are high in, in the well. Now, if you don't have high carbonate, then uh, obviously you're not going to have much in the way of uh, uh, magnesium carbonate forming. So, so certainly you got to have the carbonate there for, for that to happen. So, so that's that's a little bit about how the uh, uh, how the the uh, pH and and uh, and redox diagrams work. So, so that once again that becomes important when we're looking at how we're going to rehab this well because. The chemicals and the techniques you use, especially the chemicals you use for cleaning things out, is going to make a difference based on what type of compounds you're actually trying to break down and clean out. Okay, let's a little look a little bit at toxicity because we got to do that. And toxicity, of course, is, is important in the regulatory environment so the reason we have the levels established we do is is based on toxicity so so as i said manganese is actually an essential human nutrient at, at certain levels but when the levels get to be too high you into the hundreds of, of uh, milligrams per liter now that can be actually a neurotoxic risk so you can damage your your nervous system children tend to be especially susceptible to to high levels of manganese so so that's 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 why the levels are set where they are and why there's a secondary mcl generally you're not going to see hundreds of, of uh, milligrams per liter of manganese in a well but these MCLs have a lot of safety factors built in, so so the numbers are set, so so they're really accounting for all the safety factors with a margin of error, and so that's why they're set so low. So, but children are are more susceptible, and and so that's that's really one of the things we look at here is is set, setting those those numbers lower. So, probably adults can can tolerate a higher level than children. But we're looking at a general number, so so it's important to take the children in, into account. Um, lower levels of manganese, so below that that uh, high range that we talked about, where you can run into neurotoxicity issues, can impact certain uh, motor skills, uh, balance, and coordination. <coughs> You can get increased memory loss, anxiety, sleeplessness, and and some studies say you can actually it can actually affect your your IQ if you're exposed to to uh, higher levels of manganese on a regular basis. So once again, <coughs> that's important to to look at at where they where they set those levels, and that takes all these things into account. <coughs> All right, once again, just a reminder, uh, we appreciate your, your comments and chat, and I'll, I'll usually stop and, and uh, comment on your comment or answer any questions you might have. So, so if, you're, if, you, if, you're, uh, if you want to drop a comment in there, just let me know. And just, just a reminder to that I'm looking at those things and monitoring those things. So, so uh, and like I say, later, if you're watching the replay, Post your questions there, too, because I, I go and I, I monitor those things, and I'll answer your questions there. All right, so where does, uh, where does manganese and wells show up? Well, the USGS did a study uh, a number of years ago, and really this shows a map, and the red, obviously, is, is population expo exposed to elevated manganese levels. So you can see fairly wide risk distribution. And a lot of this, uh, really some of these studies, and, and I'll show here in a few slides, is, is that uh, we really see wells impacted by, by soil accumulations. And this, once again, is, is important where well seals come in, is sealing off uh, potentially uh, contaminating soils from, from your well. So in some parts of the country, we... There's requirements for very shallow well seals, and so you may have higher levels of manganese in the soil, and that's going to get into your well. So I think we see this uh, in, in some parts of the country, like you get down in the southeast, where they have uh, maybe higher manganese in some parts of, of the area in the soils, and a relatively short 
a seal section requirement, and so that adds up to the fact that manganese can can eventually end up working its way into your well. So, but you can see generally there's there's a pretty wide distribution of of uh, manganese and, and population that's exposed to elevated manganese levels. So so it is a countrywide thing. It's not just California or, or certain areas. Uh, it it's really widely distributed. And some of this is going to be geology related too. Uh, obviously, there's going to be natural occurrences of, of uh, manganese in, in, in rocks and soil, and that's going to show up in, in wells also. In California, for instance, uh, the State Water Resources uh, board, uh, Water Board did a, uh, did a study uh, from July uh, 2011 through March of 2019, where they looked at manganese levels and wells, along with some other ones, and they found that that sources uh, these are actually individual wells, and this could include inactive wells also. But but anything that was sampled, there were 435 sources in the state that were impacted with uh, uh, manganese levels above uh, 0.5 milligrams per liter, which is 10 times the secondary MCL. There were 322 water systems and 47 counties, and I think there's 54 counties in California. So, so that's a, that's a pretty widespread distribution of, of elevated manganese in, in water wells throughout the state. So, so really, so even though geology can influence the distribution of manganese, it is a fairly widespread. So. So you can see see here uh, that uh, 47 out of 54 counties have some sort of uh, manganese impacts in, in, in wells in that county. Now here's a study that was done in, in Georgia, and you can see that this is kind of interesting. There's iron on the left and manganese on the right. So these are detections above the secondary MC, the EPA secondary MCL, which is 0.3 for, for iron and 0.05 for manganese. And you can see kind of the distribution they have. This is interesting because they have, <coughs> excuse me, got frog in my throat today. <coughs> they have this broken down basically by by region in the state of Georgia, and region is generally going to be geology influence. So we can see the gray area up there is the limestone valleys. To the left, to the right of that, we have the uh, the Blue Ridge, which is the Appalachians. Uh, we have the Southern Piedmont, the, uh, uh, the Sand Hills, the uh, Southern Coastal Plain. And, and you get down into the uh, Atlantic Coast Flatwoods area. And you can see how the percentage of, of uh, samples exceeding the secondary MCL in these areas generally highest in the metamorphic rocks of, of the Blue Ridge. Uh, second highest is going to be in the limestone valleys, and that makes sense because uh, manganese tends to occur in, in like limestones and dolomites is, is a... Uh, component calcium and manganese substitute for each other and um, and then gets a little lower when you get down into those uh, uh, sediments down down by the uh, down by the coast so uh, and basically the same distribution for iron which which is not not surprising at all not a huge difference all in all but but uh, but there is some geologic influence you can see here even more dramatic is a study that was done in North Carolina that looked at uh, manganese occurrence in in uh, in the state of North Carolina. This was done by the by the USGS, and you can see there's really uh, the bigger black dots are are over 0.5 milligrams per liter, and the smallest black dots are really zero to the secondary MCL. So, so you can see above that is is anything that exceeds the secondary MCL. But, but really the highest numbers come from the the Carolina Slate Belt. So, and and the the Triassic Basin. So, so you're really seeing a lot of of higher manganese numbers there. So, so in this case, the geology really does count. And so what we're seeing is, is these are the soil systems developed over these rocks. 
we're seeing these shallow wells, and, and this is mainly going to be residential type wells. Uh, and so we're seeing a lot of uh, the geology influencing uh, the, the soil development, the soil then is loading manganese in, into the wells because a lot of these wells, especially residential wells, are going to have fairly short uh, uh, seal sections. So the manganese is going to have an opportunity to basically work its way into the well. So, so some interesting studies there, and it can make a difference geologically, even though the manganese is going to be fairly well widely distributed. The higher numbers are really coming from, from distinct geologic environments, as we can see here. So interesting stuff. All right, so, so how, does, how does manganese uh, occur in, in wells? There's several different ways, actually. So we're really looking at a natural occurrence here. Uh, number one, <clears throat> it can occur naturally in dolomite limestone, shales, igneous rocks, and, and ores like rhodochrosite. We talked about rhodonite. Uh, silomane, this is a picture of silomane, which is a manganese ore. So uh, you can get higher levels of manganese in these types of rocks. That is actually going to leach out because manganese, will, <clears throat> manganese compounds will oxidize in aqueous solution, and you'll get naturally higher levels of manganese occurring in, in the groundwater. So, so that can be one source of, of your manganese. <clears throat> there is an organic influence as well, and this was talking about the soils a little bit earlier. Manganese concentrations in groundwater can be impacted by levels of organics in the well system. So one of the things we tend to look at when we do our well health check is levels of organics, total organic compound, tannic acids, these types of things can be really indicators of, of an environment that's conducive to manganese accumulation. So generally the organics are going to fall in the range of humic and fulvic acids, those types of things that can, can mobilize uh, uh, the, the manganese. Next, we have corrosion, and, and this can be a significant issue as well, especially in, in things like mild steel. Uh, carbon steel, low carbon steel is going to be more subject to corrosion. Manganese, in a lot of cases, was used as, as a hardener in, in these types of steels, and still is actually. So corrosion in, in well casing and screens can release manganese then. So <clears throat> one of the things, if, if you were listen to our, our talk, uh, Groundwater Talk Live a few weeks ago where we talked about corrosion, we actually talked about how you can, how iron plus two really is an indicator of corrosion going on in your well. And if you have elevated levels of, of, uh, of iron two in your well, that indicates ongoing corrosion. That can also indicate that manganese might be being released as well. So corrosion <clears throat> is, is certainly a factor there. And then lastly, and something we're probably going to spend most of our remaining time on here today, is biological. The presence of iron and manganese-related bacteria can uh, result in elevated manganese concentrations. These are usually going to be oxidizers. Now it can go the other way. Uh, there are manganese reducing bacteria as well that will take stable manganese compounds and release manganese. So one of the things we look at, uh, I think I indicated in our well health check process, is what type of bacteria we have and our, you know, and then what can we expect from the actions of those bacteria in the well. And so one of the things we look at is, do we have iron and manganese related bacteria? So this is a picture of, of a, um, a stock forming bacteria. It's, it's a iron related bacteria, but it also uh, will, will do, uh, it, it will also oxidize manganese as well. And that's true for a lot of these bacteria it will be both iron and manganese uh, oxidizing. So Gallianella will, will be one of those. <coughs> <clears throat> so, let's dive in a little bit to manganese-related bacteria. And it's certainly been known for quite a while that certain bacteria have the ability to deposit iron hydroxide or manganese oxide in structures outside their shells, uh, cells. 
This is basically a waste product that they get from metabolizing uh, compounds in, in, in the water and metals in the water, and, and they will excrete this, and, and it becomes, and it accumulates outside their cells. So we'll have some pictures here of what that actually looks like. So most of the classic iron and manganese depositing bacteria, such as Gallianella, uh, uh, Spherotelis, uh, uh, Leptothrix, and Clonothrix were all have all been described in scientific papers back in the 19th century. So they've been known for quite a while. And, and so we've known this process is there. However, it's, it's still, uh, you know, not, not well understood. So, however, we're, we're starting to find out more. There's more scientific papers being written. So biotic mediation of iron and manganese chemistry <clears throat> often involves changes in, in the redox states of, of these metals. So <clears throat> that is going to be the role of the bacteria. They can they can uh, uh, be involved in oxidizing things, so that's changing the actual redox state of the iron and manganese. So uh, now, changes in redox states can be uh, indirect, so it can be actually just abiotic, which is not a biotic process, and so that is uh, changes in the pH and and EH or ORP alteration of the environment, or it can be direct uh, through through the bacteria. Uh, uh, enzymes or binding components will actually act to uh, to oxidize the, the the manganese and form these manganese compounds. And these uh, these activities can can be active in in the well environment. Now. As, as compared to iron oxidizing and iron-related bacteria, manganese oxide and bacteria are often poorly studied. We're seeing some studies come out here, and I've, I've looked at some of those, and there is some interesting information out there about those. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, manganese uh, oxidizing bacteria and manganese can certainly be an indicator of uh, of corrosion going on in the well. And in this case, uh, we, we may be looking at uh, microbiologically induced corrosion, something we discussed in a lot more detail in our talk on corrosion a few weeks ago. Uh, and one of the bacteria, there's a recent, been a recent paper that indicated that uh, uh, Pseudodanthomonas uh, is an, an example of a manganese oxidizing bacteria that is actually corrosive to to uh, mild steel or carbon steel casings, and they actually, through this study, actually found that that yes, it does indeed uh, break down and, and corrode the uh, uh, the mild steel casing. So so there are bacteria out there that, that are related to manganese that that do break that down. They're probably looking for for the manganese uh, in the that's in the mild steel casing as part of the alloy. And that that is is going to be part of the corrosion process because it's, it's breaking that down and it's basically using it as a food source to it's metabolizing it. So um, manganese oxidizers can interact with iron oxidizing bacteria so they can form little colonies so you can see them kind of mixed together. If you're looking at a well video and you see the orange and the black together, that sometimes indicates that that the the iron-related bacteria and these manganese-related bacteria are working together. So, so we'll see that. And then both iron and manganese oxidizing bacteria can form mineral accumulations that result in oxygen-depleted zones or anaerobic zones within aerobic zones in the well. And so this is where sulfate-reducing bacteria, which, which generally produce hydrogen sulfide gas and arc, definitely corrosive to your well can, can thrive. So, so we'll get these little communities building up on the side of your well. So we'll get the, the iron and manganese uh, oxidizing bacteria that, that thrive in an aerobic environment, so an oxygen environment, but they're creating little uh, micro environments 
underneath their, their accumulations that are poor in oxygen or anaerobic, and that's where sulfur reducing, sulfate reducing bacteria can come in and form stable colonies and thrive, even though it's generally considered to be in the aerobic zone of the well. So, so very interesting how that works, and and of course it's really important to disrupt these things when when you do your your uh, rehab on on the well because that'll that'll solve a lot of problems for you right there. Uh, manganese ox uh, oxidizing bacteria characteristics, uh, like I say, they can be both manganese oxidizers and iron oxidizers due to the fact they can oxidize either metal depending on EH and pH conditions in the well. So, so that little diagram we, we showed earlier about uh, um, uh, manganese uh, stability in the well, um, that there, there's a similar one for iron. And so we're going to see stable iron compounds, stable manganese compounds forming depending on the EH and, and the pH conditions in the well. So, so it is important to understand the chemistry of your well and, and these conditions. So, so one example of, of something that can, that can uh, both be a manganese oxidizer and an iron oxi oxidizer is uh, uh, the bacteria genus uh, Leptothrix. And we'll, we'll look at that here in just a minute. Um, so here is generally, this is a non-inclusive list of, of manganese-related bacteria. These are probably some of the more common ones, but, but there's more that, that aren't necessarily on this list. We have uh, ma uh, oxidizing, manganese oxidizing bacteria, Leptothrix, Bacillus, uh, Vibrio, Gallianella, uh, Spiritilis uh, are all oxidizing. Um, Reducing environment is uh, reducing manganese reducing uh, bacteria. Sorry, I can't talk today. Are uh, Clostridium, Pseudomonas, uh, Shimonella, and those are those are actually going to take your stable manganese plus four uh, manganese hydroxides and actually break those down and, and move. And, and reduce those back to manganese 2, which is the soluble form of, of, uh, of manganese. And, and so you'll see increased manganese loads uh, in, in the well based on, on the actions of these bacteria. So, so the type of bacteria that are in your well are, are really important. So there's a lot of relations between the type of bacteria, the EH, the pH, and all the chemistry that's going on in your well that will tell you what, what processes are gonna dominate and what, what, uh, what problems you're gonna have to deal with. And that, that's, that's really important. And, and it can get complex, but, but uh, there are some relatively simple ways to look at these things. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, later when we look at how we how we diagnose these these problems. Wrapping up, and this is just some pictures. This is what uh, a leptothrix looks like in under the microscope. So it's a it's a filamentous uh, or a bacteria structure. You can see those long whips there, and that is the 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 leptothrix uh, bacteria. This is actually an interesting one from uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, Polytech Institute uh, and State University, you can see here the brown, the dark brown and black is actually manganese and iron oxide accumulations outside the bacteria itself. So this is, this is actually the waste product from the bacteria that's being excreted here and it's forming along the bacteria it, itself. So this is where the accumulate the bioaccumulations of the manganese oxides and iron oxides will, will come from. So obviously this is microscopic, but but you get a lot of these bacteria in there, and you can see where you can start to get significant accumulations from from the, the bacteria uh, alone, uh, oxidizing the soluble manganese to uh, the the, uh, the the manganese compounds, the manganese. <clears throat> oxides, hydroxides, dioxides, and generally manganese oxides. Okay, so assessing manganese in, in your well. Uh, first off, 
the well health check process. And as I mentioned earlier, we're doing a whole class on this on December 21st. So if you're interested in that, uh, please, please tune into that. But basically what the well health check process is, we're going in and, and a big component of that is looking at the chemistry in your well. And, and we're going to, we're going to dial in the chemistry. We're going to look at not the stuff that not necessarily the stuff that you're doing for your regulatory compliance with MCLs and health issues. We're really looking at, at well, health check is the health of your well. So, so we're going to be looking at some things. We're going to be breaking the iron down, iron two, iron three, the manganese down, manganese two, manganese four, and look at the, look at the, the bacteria loads, the types of bacteria in your well, and really get an understanding of what's really going on in your well that can cause uh, corrosion issues, that can cause uh, accumulations of the metal and elevated concentrations of, of some of these compounds as well. And that in turn is going to allow you to really come up with a well-specific type of well, well rehabilitation program. All right, uh, a BART test. We, we talked about this about a month ago in on Groundwater Talk Live. Uh, the um, because there's an overlap between iron-related bacteria, manganese-related bacteria, the uh, iron-related bacteria, the IRB BART test may be a good test. They're relatively inexpensive, and so it would be a good test to at least give you an indication if, if you have <clears throat> these type of bacteria in your well. Uh, well videos. Nothing like getting eyes down the well, and as I said, you can you can look at your accumulations. These things will form little nodules on on your on the inside of your well and accumulations. So the black to uh, to dark brown is generally going to be a manganese. The orange to, uh, to to lighter brown is generally going to be uh, iron. Uh, the the whiter white to tan is generally going to be calcium carbonate. So so we can tell a lot from a well video. You can tell not only basically what type of of, uh, of accumulation we got going on, but how extensive it is and what kind of a problem it is for the well. And then lastly, there is a way to go in and actually do sampling of, of incrustations off the sidewall of the well. It's going to uh, re, uh, cause you to, or it's going to require you to pull your pump. So this can be done if you're pulling your pump for maintenance. You can go in there and collect some actual samples and see. But, but a lot of times we find that's not necessary. Between the chemistry that we get in a well health check and the well video, we generally have a pretty good handle on what what's going on down there. But but you can confirm it with the when the incrustation sampling, and uh, the people I know that do that in in California are. Our Pacific surveys out of, out of Bakersfield, and they do a pretty good job of that. They have a special tool for that. All right, kind of winding down here, manganese treatment. Uh, treatment options, very similar to iron due to the chemical simula similarities once again. So probably the primary method that most people use is, is a green sand filter, which is a glauconite sand that will filter out iron and manganese. So, so that's generally going to be, if you don't have really high levels, that's probably going to be the main, uh, the main uh, type of treatment you'll see for manganese and, and iron. Uh, there is uh, active oxidation that, that uh, treatment that can be employed, and there's a number of ways to go about that. But basically, the whole idea with oxidation is you're going to take manganese 2, that's a soluble form of manganese, you're going to oxidize that to a manganese 4 and form a stable compound, and then you're going to filter that, that, that out as, as it uh, precipitates out. So there's a number of different oxidation techniques you can use, just straight oxygen, uh, manganese dioxide, chlorine, chlorine dioxide, uh, potassium permanganate or, or ozone. All these techniques uh, are used to, to precipitate out manganese in, in, uh, in water treatment systems. So, so you're not going to do that in the well. You're actually going to do that as, as part of your, your treatment. And then lastly, there's, there's a biological removal process called the Mangazar process. That, once again, involves the use of, of select types of bacteria that are going to do the oxidizing for you. So it's not a chemical oxidation process. It's going to be a biological oxidation process. So that, I believe, is a patented process that, 
that is only available through through certain vendors but but that is um but that is out there as well and and it has shown shown some uh, some success and and so um we may see more of that in the future but but mostly we see people using the the green sand filters if if, if their levels are not too high and there's always a caveat here. So there's been some research, relative re recent, uh, 2009, 2010, that showed that uh, microbial, uh, microbial catalyzed uh, <coughs> manganese oxidation reduction, both aerobic and anaerobic, can take place simultaneously in aqueous environments exposed to considerable oxygen and chlorine levels. So this is in water treatment plants, but it has implications for your wells and, and drinking water as, as well. So, um, and can really affect manganese release and, and deposition in drinking water systems. So, you know, our, our prior strategies have really involved using chlorine and oxidizing conditions to keep uh, the, the manganese precipitated out. But this shows that may have, in certain circumstances, that may have to be rethought a little bit that you can st still get soluble manganese or resolubilized manganese uh, in, in these systems, even in the presence of chlorine and oxygen. So, so that's a little concerning. And there's always a caveat how extensive this is. We don't know, but, but there is a study out there that, that really talks about that. So that then is our, our, uh, show for today um sorry about that slide we um uh if there's any comments or questions drop them in the chat but uh, we kind of gave you an introduction to manganese and and we can see that there like a lot of things we're finding these days that the microbiological component is is huge and so we really need to understand the microbiological component that's where where we think the well health check process comes into things. And, and you can certainly contact me. Um, here's my, my direct email address. You can contact me if you want to know more about that or discuss that in, in, in more detail. I can tell you how we do that. But I think the emphasis here has really shown that, that the chemistry in your well really makes a difference in a lot of these things. And there is no one size fits all solution is really what it comes down to. And people that tell you they have a one size fits all solution really don't understand what, what's going on. So, uh, 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 okay, great. Thanks Dirk for dropping in. We appreciate you, 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 uh, you coming in and, and, uh, and watching. So, so anyway, understanding the chemistry of your well, Dirk is a well video guy in South Africa, and, and uh, he knows his stuff. He posts a lot of great videos up on LinkedIn. So, so uh, uh, check out Dirk's videos if, if you want to see a lot of really interesting situations when it comes to well videos. All right, there's my direct email address. We uh, stream this into the Groundwater Guy channel on, on YouTube. There's a long... URL, uh, it, but you can just check for the YouTube uh, or for on YouTube for the Groundwater Guy channel, and we stream into there. Um, we also stream into into LinkedIn, so uh, that's that's uh, probably our primary source. But I keep all these up on YouTube, so you can watch it on on YouTube too. If you're interested in being a guest on Groundwater Talk Live, and we encourage people that, that have interesting uh, groundwater talk stuff uh, to, to come on here and, and chat with us about, about what they do, if it's of interest to the, to the water community, we'd certainly love to have you on. And you can, uh, you can sign up here. This will get you scheduled up for a for future edition of Groundwater Talk Live, and we'd love to have you. So, And uh, once again... If you're watching this on, on replay, please post your comments, likes, shares. It all helps us get, get a wider distribution, and we, we really appreciate that. We want to reach out to as many people as possible. We put together technical information here for, for folks and, and uh, that we think is going to be helpful to the water community, especially people using groundwater. And so the, the biggest distribution we can get, the, the better. So your likes, shares, comments, all 
you know, help us uh, win with the LinkedIn algorithm. And, and uh, we certainly appreciate that. So that's what I have for you today. Thanks so much for tuning in and we will see you next week.